The recording has started. Welcome to the first WebRTC Working Group meeting at TPAC. Just a reminder of the IPR policy. We abide by it, and only people and companies listed are allowed to make substantive contributions. The WebRTC Working Group was rechartered recently. So you may have to rejoin. So the focus of these meetings, both today's and Thursday, is to make progress, mostly to make progress on new work, but hopefully to also bring existing specs to CR and PR. A little bit about the meeting. If you're here, you probably figured things out via the wiki. All of the info uh, is there on how to join this meeting. We also have links to all of the drafts, and uh, there are links to the slides on the wiki. We do need to get a scribe. Do we have a volunteer? I have started scribing, but I can continue. Okay, thank you. And that's in the hashtag WebRTC channel. So the agenda for today is for how to give a brief talk on the state of the working group. We'll talk about test and implementation status, over to see stats, uh, and then media capture and streams and other capture specs. So today is largely existing specs. And then uh, on Thursday, we'll talk about new work. So uh, Thursday, Harold will talk about insertable streams. We'll discuss end-to-end -end encryption. We'll see SVC, uh, some things relating to get display media and get browser context media. And we'll wrap up. Any agenda bashes, pe things people would have liked to have gotten to that isn't on the agenda right now? OK. All right, Harold. OK. Take it away. The status. We've been rechartered, as you know. And we're rechartered re to do exactly the same thing as we, we were before the rechartering. <coughs> Finish WebRTC 1.0. Define an object oriented API. Describe requirements for new use cases and address them. That's new protocols, new APIs. And this, all, this, this is what I have said, said before. Basically, just let, there's a few updates. WebRTC 1.0, it should just work across all browsers and all networks and so on. And we should have low level data access. People want to do funny hats or voice compression or, or, or a background blur or whatever you want. Yeah. And they need to do it perform it with a high, high performance. What people don't seem to demand as much as before is uh, ORTC or the sons thereof. I mean, web transport and web, web codecs are spinning out and becoming de facto focuses for getting, getting work done in those areas. And I believe that some of our Insertable streams processes are actually going to to help on that on that side too because once you can get the information that's going on up and down across the JavaScript API in an efficient manner, then that should help you do what ORTC set out to do. But I still want that object-oriented thing. So status of documents. We have a candidate recommendation for media capture and streams. It has some issues open, a bit old. Nothing much has changed, except that we have some new ideas that have popped up, like the in-browse in browser device picker and deprecating the pick pick by constraints mechanism but the community sense of it is still that this is 
working as intended. There are lots of products that that are dependent on it. There are uh, there's lots of stuff that works for everyone. So we we've tried to push new things off to extensions where we can, and perhaps have a late, later back merge. We'll have some slides later on what's called process 2020, where folding in new features is, is supposed to be easier. And the charter promises that we'll have, have it as rec state in uh, Q1 2021. We're good at promising. <laughs> That's next. Screen capture. Security is still a troublesome subject, as uh, Jan Iver will pontificate on a little bit later today. I think it's today. And uh, but we can't live without it. I mean, basically, the, today the world work lives on video conferences, and uh, and uh, screen share is a totally vital part of video conferences. But we do need to get the tag review done and push it push it forward. There's a new development in the Get Browser Context Media proposal that is coming up tomorrow. No, Thursday. We'll deal with that when we come to it. Next slide. Main spec. WebRTC 1.0. Still a candidate recommendation. And we have said that October 15 candidate recommendation is, yes, it's the last CR prior to your pro advancing the proposed recommendation. David's last words. There's only 10 open issues. I mean, most of them are test suit editorials and some ping, some privacy issues. And uh, those should be easy to fix, right? I just need to get around to it. There's uh, an interoperability ma matrix and confluence map that show things are progressing, but Community sense is usable, as in it's being used by. I mean, uh, it's being used by the billions of hours per day, not millions, billions. And we promised to have a wreck in Q4 2020. That's now for those who didn't notice. Next. With identity, nothing's happened. We have an old promise. We still have a normative reference that points to it. We'll have to ask forgiveness for that because the stuff we hoped for didn't happen. Next. Editors, Henrik and Yuan are currently the people listed as editors and not chairs who are cont contributing most of the pull requests on the specs. Uh, other drafts are managed by other editors. I have a couple of those myself. But uh, we need to we need to get the work done, and we on this this call are the people who are the are, are the possible workers. So next slide. That's just uh, pontificating about, yeah, people have to show up in order to do work, and they have to do work in order to, to get work done. But we have absolutely no, no way to force them. Gift economy. If, if you want some, to make something happen, volunteer. I'll mention some active documents. Capture from DOM is heavily used, but uh, no big changes. We need to have the privacy security review, tag review, all the boring stuff, and close those open issues. Recorder is uh, another one that is heavily need of updating, but we don't have the editors for it. But uh, 
the third one on the slide, stats identifiers, is luckily, uh, it's getting there. And we have active edits being done. We don't have a long list of issues that nobody seems to touch. So that's that's okay. Next. Just mentioning, yes, we have a lot of other documents. Content hits, release stuff, stuff audio output devices, the priority stuff. I, I'm trying to finish up the finish up the documents in a formal sense, but uh, there are a couple of things missing before it gets any any implementations. So other other activity we should be aware of. Next slide. Web codec, web transport, time text. I mean, web codec and trans web transport are now working groups. And they're working hard on it. Media timed events, web TV, media interest group. We had a joint meeting with the media interest group last week, which uh, showed that there is some uh, there is interest across the across the communities, but uh, we didn't come up with any specific proposals for doing anything that in a more efficient way. And uh, we need to be aware that we have people who care deeply about security and privacy issues, and uh, they want to make sure that uh, we don't. We write specs that respect security and privacy. So at this meeting, next slide, we want to finish 1.0. I mean, we're close to getting those documents shipped. And we want to look at the new APIs because if we don't make forward progress, we're, we're not moving. But the use cases and requirements are key. And raw media is kind of the current burning issue for a lot of people. And so we've taken up on a couple of efforts to, a couple of, uh, proposals to access raw media and deal with them. And we'll discuss that on Thursday too, with my famous uh, keyword called breakout box. I kind of like the keyword. Okay, now that was the very high level issue, very high level review of status of working group. If Questions, comments, and before we switch to looking at testing. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Harold. Yeah, let's go on. All right. Uh, we have Kareen and Dr. Alex. Uh, Kareen, do you want to present and turn your own slides? Um, so Dr. Alex is, uh, has his slides before mine, so I think that uh, oh, okay. it's okay if he presents first. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Um, oh, you want me to start the slides? Yeah. Um, why don't you turn them? Yeah. Um, let me get the right one then. There we go. Present now. Time screen. All right. So you should have the slides now. Is it? Do you see? Do you see it? Yeah. All right. Um, so I'm going to be fast. I'm um, just first for continuity because I presented the the previous year. I'm going 
I don't have a lot of new content, so I have 15 slides, but I, I can do that a little bit faster. Um, the first a little feedback is that um, it's still difficult to compute how much we, we testing, right? We tried to, uh, to, to put some coverage method in 2017 and we were forced to remove it. Uh, Dom did uh, uh, an, again using something called respec for uh, the, double, the, the WebRTC spec itself that is also used and extended to support uh, Google unit test and Kai tests for uh, the AV1 and AO media. So there would, they would be capacity to extend it. But right now, we don't really know how much of the document is actually covered. So the only number we have is how, how many tests pass, but we don't know if those tests actually map completely the, the, the current specification or not. So I think this is a blind spot we possibly have here. Well. And, and also, it doesn't cover any of the IETF specs, just the W3C specs. That's correct. But my understanding was that uh, for the W3C, what, what is important is, uh, is only the JavaScript API themselves. Right? But yes, uh, when, when we will get back to that. But when we need to test the network and when we need to test simulcast, uh, you cannot really test the JavaScript API in itself beyond just does it exist. There is some error message that are complicated to generate and, and require some uh, uh, programmatic access to the network and, and things like this. So if you look at the tests we do have, uh, we can see that there is a small augmentation uh, uh, of the number of tests and a small augmentation of how many tests works on, on the four different browsers. We can also see that there was a huge jump between 2018 and 2019 but since Fukuoka, it's been pretty, pretty slow, right? So 2020 was a, an interesting year for many, many reasons. Um, uh, there might have been some problem uh, because of uh, uh, the, the way testing is dealt with. Um, uh, the perception for small people that are not browser vendors that, that express that it's extremely difficult to actually push any kind of test through, uh, or simply um, a lot of people slow down and, and, and lost interest. I think this question will come back in, in different presentation from different people, and, and uh, we have to decide whether we, whether we want to push tests more or not, and what we really do about it. Um, again, it's it's a gift economy, so not only some people need to be motivated and bring the test, but when people are motivated and bring the test and they're being shut down, it kind of burn a little bit the, the motivation for, for those happy few. So this is the result we had last year uh, using Kite this time, so the, a little bit better display and granularity. It's exactly the same test being run. Uh, for those that were not here in the previous year, in the suites here, you can see that we're running on Macintosh Firefox 69, Windows Firefox 69, Macintosh Firefox 71, and so on and so forth. And for each of those, we're running all of the tests, and we can check the, the, the distribution. Uh, if you sum up all the tests, it's 18,000, but that's arbitrary because it depends on how many configuration you run. What is really interesting is the percentage here. If you use the uh, percentage provided by the interoperability from WPT, it's going to take the, the common denominator, right? So it's going to take the worst case. And that's why if I go back to the slide, nothing wants to work. I'm stuck here. I don't know if you guys still hear me or not. We can hear you. I'm stuck on the slide. Yeah, we can hear you, but the slide is the same. Um, I should do it. Yeah, it's moving now. All right, yeah, a little bit too fast. If you go back here, you see that it's telling you the interoperability in the green of four of uh, the number of tests that works across the four browsers is forty four percent, and if you look at the kite, you see that you get a sixty six percent because it's taking into account everything. If you take the the four browser, you would need to to add all the tests that are passing to get that. It gives you a different granularity. Uh, kite can run. 
WPT just like WPT does. So you can have multiple tests in one file, in which case you have a lot of false negative. Let's say you have 18 tests in one file and one is failing, then it's going to consider that as a failure. Uh, we prefer to run it as a, in an individual mode like this, where each of the tests, whether they're in the same uh, uh, HTML file or not, are actually separated and the, and the error message is uh, given nicely on, on the right hand side. That's all we, we find the, the failing tests that are important to us and report them to the browser vendors today. So today uh, we up to 70% plus, which is not bad. We can see a lot of improvement. We have one measure here, which is so those measurements were made today. The Safari Tech Preview 14.1 is a little bit behind, but that's because of the way we tested. I double check. Uh, we can see an improvement across uh, all the browsers. So now the question really is, are we happy with that? Uh, is there anything we want to improve? Um, that, that's a different question. Simulcast and SVC have been a different problem. We knew from the beginning of the working group, we WPT could, wouldn't be able to test P2P uh, usage and that you need to have some kind of network uh, uh, instrumentation. Uh, to be able to test ICE, really, there were different efforts at the beginning of the working group by uh, Niels uh, and, and, and Mozilla and, and other people. Um, and then in TPAC at Sapporo in 2015, we decide to include simulcast in 1.0. Um, and then that becomes an even bigger problem. So uh, we came with Kite, we spoke in Lyon about simulcast being frightening because we didn't know how, how much work that, that would be done. Um, we had the simulcast look back or the simulcast playground introduced and contributed by Philippe Hanke uh, this year that helped uh, have a little bit of visibility from the WPT itself on the one browser uh, setting, but really uh, we have no real uh, reference test and indication today on how much or how well that thing works. So now that Henrik has finished the test per simulcast layer, and that we did several um, hackathon and sprint on this. My feeling is that it's good enough, but I do not have number to back that up, right? So well, the, the loopback test disclosed that there were major protocol bugs. Uh, for example, um, there was, I believe, Firefox didn't support mid, so that test uh, failed. So there were, it turned out there were some pretty big bugs that were hiding in there. Um, no, that's correct. And now the question today is that, okay, we, we add a test and we find a lot of bugs, right? And we don't have more tests and we know it's not testable by WPT. So are we afraid that there are equally big bugs still lurking or not? And, well, I, and I, don't, I don't have the answer for that, really. What, what we did in last year was at the three different hackathon work with as many browser vendors and as many SF open source web RTC SFU vendors as we could to try to have a map. So this is the old one. So for example, in that one, Firefox does not support RTX. No, they do. So it would need to be updated. This is the same point of view from the SFU and a very more detailed level by level, uh, whether it's W3C or IETF uh, uh, list of all the open source media server I've came to implement and support. Now, I think this format was uh, very efficient to have both the browser and the SFU because you need client and server to be able to debug together and, and ask questions. There were a lot of assumptions. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it's a lot of work and when IETF turn uh, a virtual, it's, it's difficult to maintain. Uh, proof is uh, this year we didn't sustain that effort. We could not and, and nobody raised up and, and continued this or any kind of uh, effort on, in that regard. Oh, then there uh, is always the fact that with the ETF hackathon, there is a lot of uh, exciting subject to work on, be it quick, be it web codec, web transport, uh, uh, origin trial and things like that. And it's different to, to have all the people that needs to be around the table to be there to, to actually do that. So question, Dr. Alex, do you yeah. think that uh, we're going to have to wait till the pandemic is cured before we go back to this? Or is I don't know. I don't know. It's really difficult because those, those SFU people are not W3C member, right? Except us, maybe. So, and because usually they do not implement the JavaScript API, they implement the protocol. So naturally, they tend to see the ITF meeting as a, as a waterhole, right? 
Uh, if we try to organize that outside of the IETF, the, I don't know if these people will have time or interest to, to, to join. I, I really do not know how to do better than, than that today. Um, Mm -hmm. Unless we we decide to have uh, to to pick one, you know, Bernard, you said in Lyon the problem is I'm not testing simulcast. I'm testing simulcast with GT. I'm testing simulcast with this, 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 and that, right? So every uh, web out, every server implementation of the stack is slightly different. Uh, we could test it against uh, pipe from team, or that will be equally equally uh, okay, right? We we should do that. Now that's that's a lot of effort, and even the basic tests are not finished today. Or we lack we lack a, a volunteer to do that. So I, uh, I'm I don't know. I really don't know. I don't have the answer to to that one. I, I feel like we may, we're missing an opportunity, but I don't know how to do better. To be honest, uh, we have team in the queue. Yeah, I mean, I'm not offering to be the test site for all of this, but I am offering to um, help talk to the SFU vendors and if we have a concrete proposal, um, discuss with them what we might do. Um, there was a proposal to do a hackathon at uh, the IETF this in Vancouver, but you know, events overtook us. And I, and I genuinely think that would have taken place um, like either in real time, in real real life, or if we'd had more warning, we might have been able to organize something. I mean, I think we're going to going to do one this this winter in November. Um, so, so, Tim, with respect to the to the hackathon in, in in Vancouver, it was explicitly stated that it was a hackathon for people that didn't want to use the WebRTC and didn't care about the the browser and the JavaScript part of thing. So, hey. from the W3C point of view, I'm not sure that these are people that are motivated to work with us to make sure that the JavaScript and the browser uh, implementation is good. Did I read it correctly? Um, I think, uh, I mean, given that it's an IT, it was an IETF event, I don't think you can deduce from that what the, what the response to a W3C request would be. I think they're orthogonal. Um, certainly, a conversation we could have. There's certainly a lot of people who are interested in in having simulcast um, work. Um, so, and the SFU, and there are SFU people who, I mean, the SFUs have moved on a lot in the last year. So, I think, and they've got much more public APIs, and there are a couple of new ones. So, I think, I think it's worth going back to that that group and seeing if we've got a if we've got a concrete proposal we want to put to them. I think it's worth going back to them and seeing what they say. Okay, um, in 2019, before every hackathon, one or two months before an email was circulated to everybody to announce, you know, what what the plan and get feedback and do that. Um, I don't think that was the case at Vancouver, and it was explicitly cited. We don't want to work with JavaScript, so uh, let's do it. Let's propose and, and see what's coming. Um, it looks like it's a different group than the one that, you know, contributed in, in the table that I'm showing here. But the more, the merrier. Do you want to take that action item, Tim? If we can, if we can come up with a specific ask, I'm happy to take the action. Well, the specific ask is here, right? And there are free IETF wiki pages that describe what was done and what, was, what were the goals. So I think that could be a good starting point. Okay. Uh, I yeah, okay. Okay, I think we can just take a note and action item to try to come up with a plan. I'm not sure if we're talking about the next idea for 110 or something, but uh, anyway, thank you, Dr. Alex. Thank you. So, uh, yeah. Okay, Karine, I think these are your slides. Yeah, so if you can keep projecting, or what do you want to take back, Bernard? Uh, I only have five. You, so. uh, can you continue to turn the slides, Dr. Alex? Of course. Thank you. So as you should know, we are uh, now currently using the process 2020, which has uh, uh, little differences 
uh, compared to the previous requirements for proposed recommendation. The first criteria are unchanged. We have to show implementation experience, um, namely two interoperable uh, implementations of each feature. Uh, wide review, of course, but we already did that. Uh, we have to close all the issues that came in during the candidate recommendation review period. Um, uh, also, um, uh, not make any substantive change uh, compared to the previous CR. Um, actually, now CR is either snapshot or draft. So for the purpose of the patent policy, we consider CR snapshot. Uh, so we don't, we are not allowed to make changes to a CR snapshot um, um, before going to, well, right bef be between the CR snapshot and the PR. So because it could invalidate the reviews, it could invalidate the patent policy commitments. Um, and we may also, like for previous CRs, we may remove uh, features that were marked at risk in the previous CR. So for the purpose of the, um, in the current state of the WebRTC PC uh, spec, the CR snapshot equivalent is, the, is not the last publication, but it's the last CR that triggered a call for exclusion. We have not made any substantive change since then. And we have uh, one feature that is marked at risk. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, so current state of the, the repo is showing 10 open issues. Well, at least when I wrote the slide, I hope it's still the case. Uh, four of them being editorial, seven of them being ready for pull requests. So it means obviously uh, resolved. Uh, some were test suite issues or questions. Uh, so we don't have really substantive things that uh, would prevent us uh, going to PR uh, with regard to issues. Uh, we only got four issues in the last month and two of them were editorial. Um, one question that is open is, do we have more testing issues? about to come, so maybe related to Simulcast, for example, <laughs> or something else, or WPT, or... Uh, next slide, please. So as Dr. Alice said, uh, we had uh, improvements uh, with regard to WPT testing. Um, in the slide, you have a link to the interoperability report that shows the, the, the table for today. Um, and there is a summary of what's implemented, uh, what, what has no implementation. Right? The voice activity flag is already marked at risk in the spec. Uh, a list of things that have only one implementation. Well, actually, for uh, for for the purpose of the interop, we consider that Chrome and Edge are only one implementation. Um, so the, the big chunks that have only one implementation are SCTP transport, ICE transport, set streams, and data channel on closing. Uh, so far, uh, we don't have a report for simulcast, so we need to add something to that interop report so we can present this to the director if we request. Uh, proposed recommendation transition. Um, so ideally, something like the tables that Dr. Alex uh, showed us. Um, we were uh, previously also using the Confluence uh, results, the ideal interface tracker, uh, with DOM scripts um, filtering the, the WebRTC ones. Um, this confluence report actually now is roughly what WPT tells us. It is the, the red areas are in the same, the same places. The, the table is still interesting because it shows um, the test results by uh, areas more, more than the, what the WPT test is doing. 
Uh, next slide. So this is a comparison since last year. You have on the left last year's table, uh, well, maybe slightly longer list on the right. Uh, we can see that it's improved. There is much more green. Well, it was not too bad, but it's much greener now. Uh, the dark green, of course, shows the right thing. And, and there is less orange, which was problematic. It meant that uh, some areas were not necessarily um, bugless, so bug free. So, so I think that the improvement is is quite quite noticeable. Um, next slide. So for working group discussion is um, that some a proposal that we can introduction of a proposal that we could make. Um, we have two main features that don't have a double implementation, ICE transport and SETP transport. The other one sets streams and um, data channel on closing uh, should be fixed fairly quickly based on, on our implementer's input. The, the um, transport are going to be implemented, but not with that the that high priority that we would probably would like. Um, since now process 2020 allows us to modify a recommendation to correct normatively bugs that we have in the spec, um, we have the feeling that, well, we, I mean, Dom and I, we discussed in, internally as team contacts, we have the feeling that we can propose um, to request uh, proposed recommendation status um, with the current state of matters. Um, with that uh, plan in mind that ICE transport and HTTP transport will be part of the, the spec and will be implemented um, without saying any deadline. But uh, since it's going to be a living standard, if we, if we discovered bugs, we could we would be able to correct them inside the recommendation using the process 2020 uh, procedure. Um, so the proposal is to not delay first edition of WebRTC 1.0 further. Um, and we consider that uh, the, those features that st still don't have double inter interoperable implementation should, meet, should not be a showstopper. So that's that's what we propose. We ask the director for approval if we can go to propose rec in those conditions and have a living standard of what WebRTC 1.0. So this is it. If you want to discuss this now, any thoughts? Uh, well, I I have a question. This is Bernard. Um, so we, we've been talking about the testing problem for a while, and there have been some recent events that I think underlie some of the limitations of WPT. For example, I think it was one or two weeks ago, and Cullen is probably familiar with this, we had a breakage in the multiplex demultiplex code, um, which broke a whole bunch of applications. And in looking into it, this was not something that was covered by WPT. It was kind of a basic ITF uh, functionality. Uh, and I understand that, so WPT has two functions. One is to, as a gauge for going, whether you advance in the W3C process, but the other is it's actually used for, you know, validating check-ins. So I, I have a basic question, which is if, if obviously kite tests are not being run to, viol uh, to validate check-ins, uh, is there any way to address all of this? Because, you know, it's, it's one thing to develop the functionality, it's another way to keep it actually working. Um, is there any is there any hope for this to cover some of these basic protocol things? I don't know if you want to comment, Colin. Um, or anyone else? And just a quick comment on the, that specific bug. Uh, once it was uh, once uh, we understood exactly what the what what the problem was. Of course, FIPO was able to fish a 
to whip up uh, a web platform test that tested. The oh, he did. Oh, yeah. How, how did he do that? Well, uh, it turns out that if you if, if you just send send packets on. Uh, well, he he was mangling the mangling the the SDP of answers to to say that uh, the two video the the two video videos were having different uh, PTs, but that were multiplexed. A lot of entertain entertaining uh, mangling going on there. I'm not sure um, to actually catch all the cases, but. Uh, it, it caught at least at least this case. So there may be more uh, more bang in the whole loopback thing than uh, supposed to go, I guess. Maybe yeah, if, you, if you're willing to do disgusting things to STP, <laughs> <laughs> you can test uh, it. So uh, and um, maybe to address your broader question, uh, Belinda, I think. In general, you know, WPT is this open source project uh, where proposals can be brought up uh, for additions to the platform. Right now, indeed, the kind of stuff you can do is limited by what the test harness exposes, and apparently, well, that's already quite a bit. But some things definitely would need more, uh, you know, a more powerful underlying platform. Um, I guess the key part of adding something more powerful and maybe Kite is too powerful, I don't know, but something like Kite or Kite Lite or something um, would require buy-in from uh, the community and in particular from uh, the browser vendors that are using it as part of the regression testing. Uh, and I assume if the things that we need to be deployed is you know too hard to deploy in a CI environment then it's unlikely to, to happen. But until and unless that discussion happens, I, I, I wouldn't necessarily uh, assume that it's not possible. So Dominic, I, I agree with you. This is uh, this is the concept behind WPT. Uh, just for transparency and Harold was involved in all the discussion for two years, we tried that. Actually, today, Kite can generate uh, results in a WPT.FYY format. So we can actually send results from Kite to the database and see them with the same result. And we propose to do that, to run the WPT test for them and provide them with the same format of result for all the platform that the, the auto harness could not handle today. So, uh, for example, Android, Chrome, Android, Firefox, and iOS Safari. We send that proposal in April, and we send the data set, uh, and that was April 2020. You, you confirm, Harold? I believe that's correct, yes. Yeah, one other thing. Um, I know for web transport, we've had the same issue, right? And what we're doing now is we're writing these little servers, um, and that's how we're doing the, the, the tests for web transport. I don't know if that's a, a viable thing. You can have little little uh, servers that run as part of your WPT test? No, I mean, we could do that for the specific case of signal cast, right? With, where yeah. you need a server running. So web transport has the same problem. You, you need a quick server to be able to run your test because it's a, it's a, a client to server. But I mean, when you able to uh, generate the same format that is used by the tool and you propose to do it for free and to maintain it and it's not happening, I think this is not a technical problem we're speaking about. So for the specific so, case of SFU, we can maintain an SFU and run the test ourselves. In Lyon, we promised to make the test and the SFU open source, which we did. I think uh, um, Apple is, is running it from time to time to, to test the implementation. But it, it, it didn't change. You, you can make the effort and put it on the table. You cannot force people to use it, uh, even if there is no alternative. Right? So, I mean, uh, again, uh, I hear your frustration with what has happened with your proposal, uh, Alexana. I fully understand it. But, but first, you know, it, it may have failed for thousands of reasons. As you know, there was lots happening in the world in April 2020. Um, and so unless you've heard very specifically that this is not something anyone is interested in, then I would not necessarily give up. I fully also understand you have other <laughs> things to do. Uh, but I wouldn't necessarily take this as like a definite 
conclusion that this has no possible uh, future. Uh, I would also say that integrating results uh, in WPT FYI uh, is probably not as powerful as uh, running the test themselves as part of the WPT infrastructure. A big part of why WPT is so useful is that uh, browser vendors are able to run this as part of their own local CI without any external dependency. And, uh, you know, even running NSFU somewhere doesn't actually uh, work, I assume, for, for vendors because of their needs for no dependency uh, environments. Anyway, I, I'm not suggesting that it is easy, that it will be trivial to get accepted or anything, uh, but I wouldn't uh, say that this is uh, uh, impossible if we can indeed show that the effort needed to get there is proportionate to the value we expect for, for the WebRTC ecosystem. OK, thank you, everybody. I think we're going to move on to the WebRTC stats presentation. Henrik, do you want to turn the slides? Uh, sure, I can do it. All right, can you see it? OK, so I'm going to give an update on uh, WebRTC stats, focusing on what has happened since uh, last TPAC and where the implementation is at today. And so if you remember last TPAC, there were a lot of issues and discussions. And I would say the, the primary focus was to enable simulcast. Um, and we did this by moving a lot of things around. So just to recap, the, the old stats hierarchy that we had was not compatible with uh, simulcast because uh, we put a lot of things in the track stats. So you had one track stats per uh, attachment and it was a mix of track metrics, sender receiver metrics and encoding and decoding metrics. And we had the outbound RTP uh, stats object, but um, it was famously not per layer, so you might have three simulcast layers with 30 FPS, and it shows up, shows up as a one outbound RTB with 90 FPS. Um, next slide. All right, I'm the one doing the slides. There we go. Um, so the the ma major update this year is that the simulcast stats migration has completed. Um, the outbound and inbound stats objects now contain the encoding and decoding metrics that were previously found in track stats. We have uh, outbound RTP objects being generated per simulcast layer, and uh, track related metrics have been moved to uh, a media source. And in the spec, we moved the track stats object to the obsolete section because the relevant metrics can be now can now be found elsewhere. And uh, the implementation, as of M86, we're talking about the Chromium implementation, that it's the leading implementation. Uh, it's shipped in M M86. We had simulcast since 84, but uh, in 86, we also added the uh, inbound RTP uh, corresponding move. Um, and we still return the track stats for backwards compatibility reasons but they do not contain new information. They contain the old stuff, which is aggregate stuff. Uh, so if you want to look an overview of the spec today, I made a beautiful drawing. I think I forgot to draw an arrow between the transport object and uh, some other objects. But in any case, this is basically the, the overview of the entire stats spec in terms of uh, dictionary uh, dictionary objects. Um, and if you're familiar with the WebRTC uh, APIs, uh, this maps pretty closely with the objects you see in the APIs with the addition of RTP metrics and some minor differences like the transport object is a mix of the DTLS and ICE transports, but it's a pretty good view uh, of, of things. But um, so just to show you what is actually implemented today, this slide, scratch, 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 scratch. Um, so there are there are some things missing. 
but there's not a lot of metrics missing. It's mostly uh, objects. So next slide here. Uh, as an overview of what's missing. Uh, the remote outbound RTP side of the RTCP metrics are missing. And this includes stuff like round trip times and other information from the RTCP report. Um, we have the remote inbound RTP, but not remote outbound RTP. I think the primary use case of this is trying to estimate end-to-end -end delay uh, and 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 round trip time. And there's a there's a Weber C extension uh, that does offset to to the center capture time. I think uh, in terms of implementation efforts, it might be interesting to to view those as a uh, one bulk. But that's that's in Weber C extensions, and this is the spec, that spec. Uh, other than that, we have the sender to receiver and transceiver objects. They're they're missing. Uh, they're mostly they mostly show the uh, relationship between the these objects. So it's already available in the API. But if you want to, you know, inside the get stats report, figure out what's related to what, uh, you want this. Uh, but in terms of of uh, actual metrics, there's not a lot here. I mean, you can get the transceiver mid. But the, the sender and the receiver objects wouldn't actually contain the uh, encoding uh, metrics. Those would be in the outbound RTP or inbound RTP. Uh, other than that, we've added recently SETP transport metrics and ICE server metrics, and they have not been implemented. And lastly, there's the CSRC dictionary. This is meant to mirror what you get in Git synchronization sources and Git contributing sources but that has not been implemented. Uh, so all in all, most things are available, um, but there are some things missing. Uh, some of them are available outside of GetStats, and, uh, but some, some of them aren't. Um, so lastly, uh, to give an update, the uh, mandatory stats in uh, WPT, we show that we have 66 out of 77 mandatory stats uh, implemented in, in Chrome and Edge and M87. Um, I could click the link, I guess, if we want to show the rest of them. So Firefox uh, also has a lot of green, but also a lot of red. And Safari is also a lot of green and a lot of red. Um, but let's get back to the slides. Um, I wanted to give an update about percentage of all metrics uh, updated, but I couldn't find those numbers uh, before this slide. I know that more than 170 metrics have been implemented. Um, but I don't know how many metrics we have in total. Hopefully not too many more than that. Um, so that's the, that's the big uh, update that we've actually made all these changes uh, to the stats, but after the moving stuff around part, there has not been a lot of activity on the spec, and there's not been a lot of activity on the implementation uh, other than the migration. So a question to everyone is, does this mean the stats is good enough? We're all good, or does it mean that we don't spend enough time implementing things? Uh, but all in all, I think stats are in a pretty good shape, and it's mostly polishing work. Uh, does anyone want to add to that? Um, uh, Henry, basically, um, is the Sinocast going to work the same for SVC, or uh, or, or does that work in conjunction with uh, with the WebRTC SVC spec, for example? So the Sinocast stats do not cover SVC because they are uh, structured a bit differently. There was a uh, last T pack we. Uh, came up with a proposal of how we would uh, do the SVC stats, but we never merged uh, a change for that because we don't haven't merged the API change to actually support SVC. Today, if you want SVC, you have to rely on a hack that says VP9 simulcast equals SVC, uh, which is not the way to do it. Um, so this is blocked on having a proper APIs for SVCs. So it's and blocked on the WebRTC-SVC document, correct? 
Uh, yes. Uh, Bernard, I yes, think you're going to speak about that next meeting, right? Uh, well, we. I don't have any. Uh, I won't talk about stats specifically, but we will talk about the document. Yeah. The SVC, right? Okay. Yeah, I think what Henrik is saying that if the if there was a proposal for SVC that we agreed to last year, we would have the stats because I think they're just waiting for approval on the SVC side if that API gets. But if it changes or if it's the same one, we'll probably have to make some changes. But if it's the same one, we can just merge our RPR. I believe we want to have implementation experience on the SVC uh, spec first. Uh, before adding the stats for it, um, yeah. So I guess uh, another question to follow up all this is that if things are good enough, um, how do we like move this into the next state? I think we did go through one CR review. I don't think we've done one for a year, um, are we ready to take it to the next step? Um, yeah, so I think that question uh, has uh, two or three aspects. One is uh, how are we dealing, how are we doing with issues? Uh, are they all closed? Can they all be closed soon? Uh, are some of them like next generation issues? Another one is uh, implementations. Um, so we've discussed that we don't have double implementation of all MTI, uh, and I guess that means even less so of all stats, uh, which I guess brings us to the third point, which uh, I think is going to be key for that particular aspect, is uh, using process 2020 to manage it as a living standard which I have uh, somewhere in my uh, long and copious to-do list to make a specific proposal for. Uh, but that would be my suggestion, that is we lock in into the spec the things that we know are interoperable and implemented twice and mark the rest as uh, this will come into the next iteration of the rec, basically. But that's a very high level description. We need a more detailed proposal. All right, that sounds reasonable. I think. When do you think we could have like, like at least work through those steps? Uh, once TPAC is over, my brain would be a lot freer to <laughs> get into these okay. discussions. But, but I think Varun. Uh, it might be useful for you, Harold, Henrik, and I to maybe brainstorm a bit about how we would exactly want to approach this. Okay. Yeah, I mean, um, we can do it next week or, or a couple of weeks from now. Uh, yeah, definitely not next week. Uh, it's, uh, and conference week, and uh, I'm going to be brain dead. Uh, uh, but the week after sounds uh, absolutely good, yeah. Um, from my side, I'd like to see more traction on the SCPT, SCPT transport stats. Uh, I don't see any traction, both on Firefox and on Chrome. That, I think we added a few uh, based on like the conversations on on the PRs last last year, uh, but I guess you're talking about the implementation, not the not the, the spec themselves. Yeah, the implementation. Yeah, Henrik, do you have like uh, Henrik or uh, Yanni? Where do you have any thoughts on on that? Um. No, I, I don't have a. I don't have an uh, update on that. I'm personally not spending a whole lot of time on, on uh, get stats right now, and uh, I haven't heard anyone ask for this other than uh, the, well, you now and the when the spec it was added to the spec. Um, if anyone is uh, 
willing to write a, a CL for that. I'm happy to review it, but I can't promise anything in terms of implementation. I think for Firefox, we're committed to implementing the uh, mandatory stats, but uh, but no, uh, we're not committing to a timeline at the moment. And for I think SCTP stats, since uh, particularly, I think are low priority uh, since they can be shimmed, as far as I understand, and that they only provide metrics, uh, they they only provide usage metrics of the API, as far as I can tell, which you can. I I think they added we I think we added a couple of metrics from the low level stack, which okay. is like round trip time, C window, and and yeah. things. But um, yeah, here's uh, I, the I think SCTP so, transfer like, but, but they're not mandatory, are they? No, they they're are. not on the mandatory list. No. Right. right. So I think a uh, very high level question: Do we have enough stats for from a specs perspective? Uh, if there are any missing, please create a. Uh, an issue on the issue tracker. And I think in terms of uh, implementation, I think what Henrik is saying that if anyone wants to bridge the gap between the lib SCTP and, and the JavaScript layer, CLs are welcome. Are, are there any updates on privacy review on stats? We had one like a couple of months ago, or at least uh, at the beginning of the year. And I think based on, uh, I think we moved one of them, which was more controversial network type out from from the spec into like the to the other spec, Hendrix spec. Um, so I think that's that's where we stand. I think there's only one PII marker right now on the on the whole spec, which is I think codec implementation, decoder implementation, and uh, encoder implementation in the codec. So those are the only. And since it's not mandatory to implement, I think people can leave it as null. Right. I believe there's a similar issue in WebRTC PC uh, raised by ping on exposing hardware capabilities for get capabilities and STP. And I think our pushback there was uh, that uh, this information is also available in other APIs like WebGL and WebGPU, and that any permissions should probably be at a higher level in the in a different spec. Right. So I think that's why the, the, the codec implementation thing is just like behind a PII flag. Um, it's up to the browser vendors to implement it or like put something there, right? Like they could just say whatever the user agent string is um, in many cases. I think what people want from that is it a hardware implementation and a, or a software implementation. That's the only thing that people are looking at as like one bit of information. Uh, and if anything, what? software implementation. OK, I think uh, we should move on. Yanni Bar, you have the floor now. Uh, All right. Should I share my slides? All right, we're doing yeah. it this way. OK, hold on. Present. So can you see my screen? Let's see here. Yes. Is this going to work if I hit present or no? I think it works. Are you using you Firefox? Percent. Yeah, I'm using Firefox. Uh, then I'm, gonna, I'm just going to do, uh, do it from here. Can't you use get tab media display, whatever? <laughs> Yeah, I think this this is enough. Though I don't have any animations or anything. So, all right. So um, we had a joint meeting with Ping last week. Uh, Ping has helped us review uh, media capture APIs for camera and device enumeration, and uh, twelve issues were filed um, uh, back uh, back in the beginning of the year when uh, when they had started this review. Uh, four are still open. Eight were closed. Seven PRs were merged from review. Um, I have more details. Uh, Hopefully, most of this audience also were in the joint ping calls. I'm not going to double up too much on slides, uh, not doing a review of what we did, but I'm going to review the uh, open privacy issues 
that we presented to Ping and we showed them our consensus for our proposed solutions. So we're just going to go through solutions. And then there are some other issues uh, we can dive into for media capture in general. Um, so uh, 640 was to only reveal labels of devices the user had given permission to. We agree that labels are bad for web compat and privacy, but it'll take time to get rid of. Uh, we've improved exposure quite significantly because uh, device IDs are now not in enumerated devices, uh, except during active live camera capture or microphone capture, and shortly after in the same document session. Uh, labels of non-granted devices are still needed during capture to support sites implementing device pickers in browsers that don't grant all devices at once. That would be, for instance, Firefox. So the long-term solution, unfortunately, is uh, is long term, and that is to move toward uh, in browser pickers for camera and microphone, which we have moved to uh, media capture extensions, which is our new repo for uh, for holding uh, items that are uh, incubated to be into considered for later rec inclusion in media capture main. And right now it's just in browser camera picker, and I think some other things like uh, channel uh, audio channel layout beyond stereo, that kind of stuff. Um, uh, there were some short-term issues uh, mentioned. We're going to do some PRs for those. Uh, that labels may contain private information, so we should encourage sanitation and clarify that they're for display purposes only. We have some web developers uh, comparing them to model and manufacturer, which is not desirable, which is why labels are bad. So we're going to close this issue once those close uh, short-term issues are resolved and revisit when we do in-browser picker extensions. So uh, 645. Uh, limit enumerate devices so that if you only share camera, you can only enumerate cameras. And the consensus is to do that. Um, this is what Chrome is implementing, so bre breakage risk should be low. Uh, should enumerate devices default to return an empty list? That was a request from Ping. Uh, unfortunately, not very web compatible because uh, people rely on these booleans to um, websites rely on these booleans to uh, sh decide whether to show uh, UX for camera and microphones. Um, so instead, we're going to add, uh, we're going to continue to return those booleans, but this back allows user agents to fake devices, which Safari has an option for. And we're going to add a note for that. If any questions, please uh, interrupt. Um, and we also have input device info get capabilities, meaning you can do call enumerate devices uh, during live capture and get the capabilities of all devices. This is also needed to ensure. Uh, to, to maintain the app constraints uh, during the picker, as well as for to match the initial uh, gum request. Uh, long term, um, again, in browser picker with uh, constraints based in browser picker would obsolete this need. Um, I should clarify there's a difference between uh, you can have an in browser picker and still have a con constraints based uh, selection where you still offer the user uh, choices within the constraints of the app which is separate from, uh, uh, you could also go with an in-browser picker that has no constraints. So, so the question of whether to keep constraints is sort of orthogonal to a picker in a way. Um, this is no consensus here, but uh, the feature is at risk. So we're going to revisit that later uh, with the in-browser picker. And now we're into regular issues. And um, I think you, and, you had some issues here, but I don't see slides for them. I think these were all slides from last year, and the issues have been resolved. So OK, I'll awesome. Them. Thanks. And uh, I think next slide is Henrik. I can drive the slides if you want. Oh, sorry. I, I, I didn't see this one. I think this is uh, old as well from last year. You can okay. uh, skip we it. We can skip. OK, so, uh, some, so in order to make progress, I uh, tried to triage some of the different specs. Uh, and um, find issues that would be helpful to have uh, in front of the working group. So uh, issue 660 is uh, handling of rotation for camera capture streams. Uh, what happens when the phone is in portrait? And uh, we can test that in the different browsers. And what happens is uh, the only basically uh, the constraints uh, pretend everything is always, constraints are always in landscape, basically. So you can constrain against the values as if they're landscape. However, when you return your phone into portrait, or if you have your phone in portrait and call Gate Media, uh, the constraints, while they're applied in landscape, 
Um, everything is applied in landscape, except when you call get settings, the values you get back are rotated uh, if you're in portrait mode. So only get settings is rotated. The constraints are not, capabilities are not, constrainable properties are not. So the proposal is to specify this because that's what browsers are doing. Any objections? It's also simple because it avoids a lot of thorny issues. Uh, we don't have the over-constrained event anymore. So if you had min-max constraints, they might apply in, in one aspect. But if you rotate the phone, they might no longer apply. So it's actually a quite a, uh, a simple, uh, if not exactly elegant solution. So yeah, unless there's any objection. Cool. Yeah, that looks good to me. Um, so have you tried also apply constraints before, after rotating or, or, or so on, or do, do you expect any? I did not specifically try apply constraints, like but uh, I think we would want to specify, specify that uh, it, it works the same uh, yeah. as the initial get user media call. That would be my expectation. Okay. If it doesn't, we have to, there'll be a slide at the next dinner room. <laughs> okay, that, that sounds good to specify right. it. And uh, if all browsers are behaving the same, we should just do that. <clears throat> all right. If there are no questions, then I'll move to the next slide. <clears throat> and <clears throat> issue 735 is to make a fitness distance, uh, change it from, right now it says may, and uh, this is a suggestion to change this to a should. Um, this is, uh, basically there's there's two things. There's select selecting algorithm, which is used in both get user media and uh, apply constraints. That's already says should, but as far, but get user media also uses it for device selection, meaning pick one camera over another based on constraints. And that one has a may. Uh, I think we need better web compat around device selection, and that's important for both this spec and uh, other specs like image capture. So for example, if you specify, uh, you know, I want a 1080p, but also 60 hertz frame rate, which device is more important to the app? Um, and you could specify, uh, you know, I want the device from last time, but if you don't have that device, I want a new device that's 1080p uh, ideally. So, you know, rather than figure out which is exactly more important, I, there's a million corner cases. Uh, predictability trumps usefulness at the edges, which I like to say, which means that it's more important that it works the same across browsers than for it. The constraint syntax, uh, you can always come up with combinations that are not intuitive, but as long as they produce the same results in all browsers, I think we're good. And, and uh, similar for uh, pan, tilt, and zoom, you could specify, I want 1080p, but I also want to be able to zoom. Uh, so getting this, uh, uh, Getting a, a stronger um, consensus around uh, fitness distance uh, would help. I mean, we have consensus. Stronger implementation requirements around fitness distance would ensure that we could uh, get better web compat in media capture main, but we could also fix some uh, current spec bugs in image capture, which I'll uh, discuss uh, on a later slide. Uh, does that sound good? This is UN. Um, I mean, may and should. So should it, it? So it does not change for requirements. So user agent can still do whatever they want, be it a may or a should. I don't think that we can do a must without uh, providing right. additional statements like, hey, if user is actually selecting <clears throat> a device, whatever the distance, we don't <clears throat> care. And yeah. the, the, the same apply with. Uh, pan tilt zoom to me at least uh, if the user is prompted and it said hey do you want to grant permission to pan tilt and zoom then that pan tilt and zoom um, becomes higher in than a regular eight or with um, priorities so it makes me think that right. overall fitness distance is very difficult to provide results that user agents want. So I, I don't know. Uh, I, I'd like at least to specify uh, some guidelines then mm -hmm. where we that we could at least uh, be uh, agreed to them, like the device picker thing, or maybe pan tilt zoom as well, mm -hmm. or permission related things. 
right. um, so that the should is a bit stronger in a sense. The yes. additional issue I have with fitness distance in general is that um, in a lot of cases, you end up with uh, fitness distances which are exactly the same between devices. Right. So the fact that you say may or should is not changing that. Mm. And maybe this, all devices have the same fitness distance is an interop issue as well. Um, right. We should, yeah. we should validate whether it's a, an interop issue before fixing it. But uh, yeah. Well, I, I think even if there is no uh, webcom, even if browsers are doing the right thing today, I think it may have already always been a mistake to use May here because May is quite weak. It's sort of like most browsers won't do this, but they may. Uh, I think the reason it was a May was actually because of Firefox because we have a permission prompt. So actually, I think we. Uh, so I'm not opposed to strengthening fitness distance further, and I'm not opposed to uh, adding more guidelines. But I don't think any of that stands in the way of fixing this. Uh, I think the May here is more of a bug. And for the next slide, there the one exception that I think cost a May was that in Firefox, uh, we do show a prompt sometimes where the end user gets to override it. So basically, constraints tell us what is most important to the app, but then the user is more important than the app. So the proposal PR here is to add the should, but then add an, a clarification uh, that, however, it may also uh, user agent may also use internally available information about the devices, such as user preference. Another example of uh, externally available information is if you know one camera is the default device for the for the for the for the right. computer. So it's true that fitness distance doesn't always answer, doesn't always narrow choices down to one. But uh, uh, we don't have a PR right now to address that, and that's sort of orthogonal to this, I think. Um, uh, the PR looks fine, except uh, like there, 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 there are other cases, like for instance, PTZ is another case where we somebody yeah. might disagree with, with it. So, um, I have a separate slide I, for a PTC. Okay. Okay. Cool. All right. I Any think this objects? takes us one step closer, right? With uh, the the ideal would be where everything is. Uh, very well specified and testable, and and uh, uh, should and a may are both not testable, but at least we clarify the intent and say do this unless you have a re a good reason not to, rather than do this if you feel like it. So I think we can uh, I think we can do this and then iterate on further improvements separately. Great. All right, next slide. Um, so. Uh, I want to discuss, uh, not a lot has happened, unfortunately, on media capture extensions for camera and microphone. Um, but uh, I want to present some of the slides we showed to Ping last week. So apologies to people who had uh, were part of both meetings. Uh, long term, we want to get away from in-content device selection. And the Ping wants privacy by default, where the site asks for a category or category of devices. And the browser prompts for one, many, or all devices. And the site gains access only to the device and label of hardware the user selects. Now, we had had great progress in audio output capture um, within the last year, where we now have, uh, we actually have an in browser picker there. Um, and uh, it's select audio output. I'm mentioning it here because it's a setup for a camera and microphone uh, to contrast differences. So you can do select audio output, which uh, gets you a picker. And then if, only if the user selects, um, something to share, uh, you get an ID exposed uh, returned and also exposed in enumerate devices. Uh, this is great because it works, and then you can take that idea and call it uh, set sync ID on it. This works without microphone permission, which is unlike the old API, and it so which means you can redirect audio from any source. So that's a great uh, new feature, actually. It's often iframes by default, needs allow equal speaker selection, and Firefox is planning to implement this soon. And we want to thank Safari for driving the design, the design on this one. So um, there's still, a, uh, we also added a device ID member. These are not constraints. It just has the same name as a constraint. So, it's a diction so select audio output takes a dictionary with one member, device ID, um, because sites still need to be a way to remember device to not prompt every time, assuming the user permits. 
Uh, but we, what we uh, what the design does here, which is great, I think, is that uh, you have to call select audio output again to validate the ID. And what that and if if accepted, if the user agent accepts the ID, then the picker can be skipped. Uh, but the user agent may show the picker at times, uh, for instance, if the speaker device is no longer available, uh, which uh, the intent here is to deter trackers so that the, we, we're banking a lot in get user media and select audio output that uh, tracking libraries will not uh, prompt, not rips, risk a user prompt or uh, turning the device hardware light on for three seconds or turning on camera and microphone in browser notifications for three seconds. And again, the ID only appears in enumerate devices if the call succeeds. So leading into, um, since we have this, why don't we add select camera and select microphone? Well, there are a couple of complicated reasons for that. Uh, web apps want constraints on camera selection, like resolution. Web apps want some discovery. Uh, there's some immersion use cases where you know Twitch streamers now are using two cameras where they can show their face and their dog. Uh, web VR might be other uses, more complicated uses where it's not as simple, just web conference. It's easy to think that camera is only for web conference. Um, users want sites to remember their configuration and not pick a device every time. User agents, um, although that was so, somewhat solved with select audio output. Uh, and also user agents differentiate in permission models. Uh, some browsers have on-off permission, permission states, others have one shot or both. And there's still innovation in, in that space, which I think we should protect. And more importantly, what should the migration path be? Uh, get user media, unlike SetSync ID, is already implemented in all browsers. So what site is going to upgrade to prefer a less powerful, less established API? So for now, the consensus goal that we have is to get rid of labels and capabilities of non-captured devices. And uh, going further than that, we don't have consensus of right now, but that would be things like uh, limiting um, uh, putting more spec limits on permissions or limit the uh, capability exposure of the currently selected device or the in-use device. So what I presented to Ping here was uh, uh, basically the user chooses semantics, which is uh, what I call get user media plus plus here, where we have a migration path where we can fix existing get user media and enumerate devices, uh, but we have no commitments yet for uh, anything like select camera and select microphone. So the, the, if you look at the during capture, so before capture, uh, we're very private now, which is good. So the remaining issue is, is that we still uh, share all lab labels of all devices and we share all their capabilities to the website during capture so that they can build their in-content device picker. So we would like to get rid of that. And that's what the middle option here does. So you can have a, a label-less device picker style API where the uh, site still has constraints, but the browser is the one showing the prompt. And um, this has no implementation at the moment. Um, and the thinking here, this is sort of a, apologies for the repeat, but get user media already has a picker in Firefox tied to permission, which lets the user choose instead of the agent within the app's constraints when choices are more than one. The apps could have used called get user media again just to get a, just to get a different camera, but web compat prevents showing a prompt then because a lot of sites expect the same stream they got the first time. So uh, I'm covering the semantics user chooses here, which we've discussed in previous meetings. New semantics would mandate a picker if app constraints don't narrow down to one. And this is actually orthogonal to permission. And, um, the, and there's a migration strategy that may result in us flipping the default or not. Um, but what it would also uh, do is it would make get user media usable to implement in browser pickers. Um, and there's some criticisms and features would be that if we were to flip the default, this would mean people, people might see people with multiple devices. People with just one device would see no difference, but people with multiple ones might see differences on more like demo sites and other sites where that haven't implemented a, st a strong device selection, device management policy. So they might be prompted every time because if the websites use video true every time, uh, it might be, whether that's more or less annoying than the uh, the site picking the wrong camera every time, it's probably less annoying than that, but more annoying than it just happened to 50-50 pick the right device every time. So, so that's the, and then hopefully we can um, deprecate the old way of calling it using media. 
where we don't need to share. And then we can remove labels and capabilities from uh, enumerate devices. We can even make it return a dictionary instead of an interface, because right now it's an interface because it has to have the get capabilities method on it. So that'd be nice. So that's it for that. Uh, next step. Question, sure. uh, wouldn't, wouldn't removing labels, so if you go back to slides, I said, uh, one more slide, step three, remove all labels from enumerate devices. Oh, right. I think one slide, more slide? 71, yeah. slide 71. I think. Okay. Oh, yeah. We're way too back. Oh, there we go. Uh, yeah, remove all labels from enumerate devices and deprecate gate capabilities, and then maybe flip the default. So my question is, if you don't flip the default and you don't actually, you know, force migrate everyone to browser chooses, how could you mm -hmm. possibly remove uh, labels, right? Because if if the browser isn't doing the picking, then the application is doing the picker. Uh, the picking, and then what will they display? <clears throat> will be just device one, two, three, four? Well, so the, the steps are, first, we implement user chooses in all browsers. That's the big one. Once people have that, uh, sites don't have to use in-content device selection anymore. So how do we get them off of, of doing that? Well, first, we have to offer the ability so they can call, get user media with semantics, call on user chooses in order to invoke the now new, newly wonderful in-browser pickers. So now there's a, uh, um, how do we get sites to call that API? We remove the labels from enumerate devices, or we threaten to remove the labels from enumerate devices, which means that it doesn't really break sites. It just makes them less attractive, which is perfect because their pickers okay. will still work, but it'll say camera one, camera two, camera three. And their users complain to the site, and the site uh, goes, oh, we need to call the new API to get the labels okay, back. OK, that, that makes sense. Thank you. That was what cool. I was asking. No, thanks. Good question. I don't think it will work, but that's uh, worth trying. Uh, we, we have to in the queue. Sure. Was there a okay. question? Yeah, I guess this is a Colin here. Um, I mean, the I, the breaking, I mean, this. so, so look, the, the idea of getting a better way to do this, I'm, I'm all in favor of. Uh, this is one of the worst parts, I think. Uh, you know, this is one of the most constantly identified problems of people using WebRTC systems is the difficulty of controlling the, the which the input devices they're using. So, I mean, I'm, I'm really glad to see what we're, we're doing on that. But the idea that the way we're going to get people to move to the thing we wish they would do is by making them their life really painful for the thing that they currently do. Um, I would be surprised to see Chrome and WebEx and everyone else do that, I may have you talk to people about whether they would actually break that? Well, I think we know from experience that websites don't move unless there's some disadvantage uh, introduced. So if we have well, another well, way. I, I, I think that is just carrot. totally ignorant. I, this, this, right. this is not reasonable to say at all. Okay, mm -hmm. People constantly move to better things when there's something better yeah. to move to, right? Sure. So, so, so uh, the migration strategy does not put in timelines. So, so we could offer the new functionality uh, a year ahead of any, uh, you know, we might not be able to remove labels for a couple of years. And then we can build the new APIs. So the hardest part here, I think, is to get uh, vendors, frankly, to implement these pickers. So once sure. we get so that, have you asked the vendors of the people who need to implement this whether they like what you're doing? Well, um, well they're all here. Do you like what, what, I, what we're doing? Uh, no, I mean, like, no, right. they're not all here. I mean, like, go pick the major apps that use WebRTC. And oh, ask I, sorry, right. I thought you said vendors. I meant uh, browser vendors. The vendors yeah. are the people making the JavaScript, making the app. Okay. The vendor is not the browser vendor, right? Okay, I meant browser vendor, sorry. <laughs> okay, yes. so who cares what the browser vendors think? That, what, that, that's well, the problem, right? <laughs> well, step one is to get the browser vendors to implement these pickers. So I think that's the... So this migration strategy may fail, right? Sure, so no, no, still try. I'm not, I'm not talking about the the... the Implementing the browser, the picker stuff. I said I like that. That's good. Right. What I'm talking about is the deprecating the stuff that's already there, and that has to do with the applications, not the browsers. So, so, so I think in order in order to remove the in order to remove the permission and sorry the privacy leak here, we have to remove the labels. So at some point, and this this is an avenue where we would lessen the pain of doing so by offering new APIs. So I think. Um, that was my point with the first slide. If if we implement a new API and we never get rid of get media, we still have a privacy 
issue because all, all the trackers are going to use the old API. So we have to remove these things one way or another uh, if we want to remove the privacy I leak. Th so I, I, I have a... Go on. Yeah, I think web app developers, they will um, probably look at what is new and they will look at the old get user media and the new one. And if the device picker is a better user experience, we will have probably a nice, a nice path of deprecation. But that's really the thing there. It should be uh, much better than uh, what they can do. So, so I, I have a question. What happens if you do both those last migration steps simultaneously to a site that hasn't been updated in three years? If I read it right, what happens is that the, the, the browser picker from out of the browser Chrome kicks in and, and the user gets to see a full list of their cameras. Like it actually, if I read it right, the right thing happens. I yeah, mean, it's so not the, what the site expects, but actually the user experience is correct. The user will get what the user wants because the user will be able to pick it in the in-browser picker. The unexpected thing would be the in-app picker, which would show a uh, you know, device one, two, three, four uh, still. And, I, and then I don't know if, if it would pick those properly. I, I think it would, but it would make less sense than the... Uh, in browser prompt at that point. So right. One downside with the idea of uh, having both approaches uh, at the same time in a given browser is that then you have two prompts and uh, users will have to understand both prompts. And that's that's bad. So you could go uh, a what? step further and you could make it so that the that that the the in Chrome prompt limits what comes back from the in <clears throat> in page prompt so that what they see they they select it like this is for the site that's done nothing okay uh, and you do the last two steps simultaneously the user comes to the site they do something they choose the camera which happens the, correctly and then the in browser within the the page picker says you've chosen the camera effectively because it lists the only one that's still available Yeah, I'm, I'm not that worried about sites that uh, I think sites either do nothing or they or they both remember the user's device from last time and implement a picker. So I think those are the two categories. There's either there's the responsible sites that have the big sites basically have device management and there are those that don't. Those, these are the two camps. But so I think. For, yeah, go ahead. Uh, for, for sites that, you know, the three year old site that didn't update. Uh, if we take away the, the list of devices, you know, switch the default so we only return the one and only device that the user did pick, uh, the user will be super happy, you know, for their first choice. But if they later go, oh, hang on a minute, I want to change the camera. Uh, and the only way to change the camera inside of this three-year-old app is to look at enumerate devices. The app will think that there are no other options and okay. will probably not reprompt the user. So you could get stuck with the wrong, um, right. either get stuck with the wrong camera in this edge case, or uh, you do list all the devices, but you you know label them one, two, three, four. Or right. you decide to do something that is forbidden by the spec, which is to change the source of an existing track. Ah. In either case, I think um, <laughs> I, I think we're uh, a couple of years down the road here, so I don't think think we need a uh, decision at this point. And I don't I think we're actually happy to let user agents uh, deal with whether they want to how backwards compatible they want to be. And for instance, maybe maybe only some browsers, maybe Safari will want to deprecate their labels first for uh, their own interests. Maybe not, and then websites. The, the challenge then becomes, oh, labels don't work in Safari. Uh, maybe we, oh, there's a new API we should use. I mean, that's not very different than what we have today for SetSync ID, for example. So um, in any case, this is what was presented to uh, the, the Ping working group, and they seem to like that. Uh, and the next plan is for Firefox to implement select all your output. And we hope to gain an experience from that uh, because there's some UX challenges that are similar in that area. That seems like uh, a great plan. Okay, cool. 
Any other questions on that? All right. Then we have a next slide. It says other I, capture specifications. I, want to make sure I, I understand sure. correctly. So you do not plan to deprecate that in the upcut, like as we push out the 1.0 specs. Not not for the 1.0 specs. No. This is okay. being this is a uh, this is be uh, media capture extensions. So this is a longer term plan. Okay. And the slides I, I joke twenty. What did I say here? Uh, twenty twenty three. No more labels. Thanks. Uh, all right, cool. I, I think the only thing that goes away uh, in 1.0 implementation is calling enumerated devices before you do the get user media call and seeing no labels. Uh, is that correct? No, right. You only have one device in that case. Audio, video, true, false. Uh, so in 1.0, uh, it already says that if you you don't see any labels or device IDs except for one camera and one microphone until you're actually actu actively capturing camera. So that's uh, stricter than it used to be. It used to be you could have persistent permission to devices, and then you would get labels. And the spec says now that's not sufficient. You need to actually actively be camera capturing in the document or have been capturing in a document the same document. And the reason for that is web compat, because uh, that lets, that gives us much better web compat between browsers that have persistent permission models by default, like Chrome, and browsers that don't, like Safari and Firefox. And uh, it, what we're basically done, we've deprecated the uh, uh, enumerate first strategy of device picking. So to, and now most websites like this one have a device first strategy, where you ask the users for their device uh, they used last time or uh, the OS default. And then once they see that camera and have it, it added permission, then you have a, you know, a gear symbol options panel where you can switch around between your devices. And that seems to be good uh, for most sites. There's been some pushback. I think big blue button was one. That's another one uh, that, that had a different use flow. But uh, such as life, we had to uh, this was in response to ping, and they were very happy with our improvements in that area. All right. Uh, other capture specifications. Um, I see uh, there's some, and this we have slides per per uh, spec here. So this first one is screen capture. And I think that's issue 60. Uh, Harold? Uh, tab capture. Um, and the, the the point was that uh, the browser display sir, the idea of tab wasn't defined. So uh, when I looked at the look, looked through the HTML5 documents, I found that the stuff that seemed closest to what the naive user calls a tab. It's a browser display surface. So uh, I suggest that we just uh, say that uh, that uh, uh, that uh, we we capture the tab and it and it's a browser display and we call call it a, a browser display surface. So I, I don't think that's a change actually. I think it's I think it's just using the correct correct term. Yeah, I think so the intent would be that um, so you're, you're capturing the browsing context, basically the the tab that and you're seeing at the moment, you'll see what the current document there is. But if that current document changes to a different document, you'll see the new document instead. That, yeah, yeah, that's that's what we currently do. And that's that's what users have come to expect. And that's what that's what they should continue doing. Yeah, I think that makes sense. And uh, we should, but terminology-wise, I think we only use the phrase browsing context and avoid uh, the word current document just to avoid confusion. So we can we can uh, bike shed on the language there. I think. Yeah, I'll make a pull request and we'll bike shed, bike shed on language. Cool. So uh, I uh, I agree with this. Just uh, just a question about um, because here we talk about changing the current document. I think there's language somewhere that you can't change the source, uh, or am I misremembering? I'm just wondering if we need to clarify right. something there. Like, what is a source 
uh, well, because the, it sounds like the source changes if you change the tab. But I'm not well, sure. the source. We should be clear, and the, the source is the browsing context, which is the frame within the, the document is displayed, if you will. Like it's a container. So we're sharing the container, uh, and you're seeing the current document at any time. So if you navigate, if you go backward, forward, cache, for example, with the back and forward buttons, you would see the content change that's being captured. And I think most users understand that um, when they're sharing a tab, that it's not just, uh, that capture doesn't end if you hit the back button. Uh, oh, right, right, and that as well. I'm thinking of the case where uh, in in the Meet, if you click on a different tab, and then you uh, there's a UI button in the browser that says share this tab instead. <clears throat> And then you actually move context to a different you know, tab. Well, you can get back. around you can get around all that by defining it as a virtual source, right? So this it's user agents aren't really limited here, other than they're encouraged to explain what the that what the source is to the user, so that they they're not it's not lost on them. <clears throat> I think the language we have there now, now is mostly that the source can't jump around in, in confusing ways. To confuse OK, uh, I'm, I'm happy with that. I'm just suggesting we clarify uh, that part, because uh, I wasn't sure if uh, Chrome's changing tab was against the spec or not. But I'm happy to hear it's not. Uh, yeah, I so think it's not because oh, the, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, just I think it would be a problem if the permission prompt, uh, the picker, made it look like you're sharing one tab, and then later you can share a different tab. Um, so so you, if you had a choice that said current tab, for example, that might be a way around that, or the active tab as a, as a special smart choice, if you will. Um, if you have other UX ideas there, we could probably add that as an issue to the spec. I mean, we should be allowed to innovate, but uh, it'd be nice to double check that it makes sense. Yeah, what I wanted to say okay. was that uh, what I wanted to say was that uh, with regards to sources, I mean the spec doesn't have the concept of sources as such, except for the device ID setting. Well, it has a concept, but not uh, exposed surface. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's not it's not exposed to, to the web uh, as a, I mean Correct. the concept is in the spec, but but it's not exposed. So the only way that it's exposed is via the device ID setting. Um, yeah, so screen sharing does not have device IDs exposed, yeah, exactly. uh, but but it does have track label, and there's a issue on yeah. What but if the, you don't change that, you are technically not changing right. the source. I mean, uh, as long as you define source as something that you are producing. Right. About. The spec is venturing into uh, trying to dictate UX a little bit here, which I think is fair given the security implications. So. But yes, you're right. There's no exposed surface other than track label, uh, where I think we have an open issue. But we, we're not proposing a slide here because we don't have a good solution yet for that. Um, um, so some people are asking to be able to know whether a given tab is same origin or not, or is uh, whitelisted origin or not. And if it's not the good origin, then they would mute the track or disable the track, basically. So in that case, if, we, if we're going down that road, which seems to make sense if you navigate, you continue, then we would have to have some kind of like an event mechanism to say, hey, uh, something changed, so please check your origin. Right. I think we have a whole um, session for the next meeting about get display media and same origin that we could probably discuss there, if that makes sense. Just looking at the remaining slides here and time. All right, uh, okay. anything I else? Th this part is easy. It's relatively easy. Should we go on? OK, um, next slide is a media recorder. Uh, there's two issues. Uh, first there, one is Henrik. Uh, these are, again, old slides from uh, TPAC last year. Uh, All right, we're going to skip those. to delete them. No worries. Uh, image capture. Um, that I promise to come back to. So in image capture, there's uh, two problems um, with that was discovered this year with uh, pan, tilt, and zoom constraints. Uh, right now, 
the spec has kind of a, I hate to use the word hacky, but it's uh, basically whenever you see a true. Uh, so the goal for context, um, they needed a way to uh, call get user media and say, I want a pan, tilt, and zoom functionality because that has, requires elevated permission. Uh, but they didn't want to specify a value for zoom because, or, or especially for, for pan, because if the camera is currently panned, they don't want to alter the default value. So they don't want the camera to move necessarily just because they're getting permission to the camera. So they invented this uh, true uh, union where you could specify true instead of a value that basically says, I don't have a value yet for pan, tilt, or zoom, but I want that functionality. Um, but the way it was implemented is a bit unfortunate, a bit of a bug, because it does not, uh, I think, we assumed that it would Im influence fitness distance, but it does not. So um, the proposal there is to expose true and false as uh, first class values for these constraints, uh, which is mostly an, um, the trickiest part is just the web IDL on implementers. But uh, the net effect on users is quite intuitive, I think, is, which means that whenever you see Wherever you can specify a value for pan, tilt, or zoom, you could also use the word true or false. And then you can basically, uh, that gives you the existing uh, access to the existing uh, fitness distance algorithm in media capture main. And uh, it's not that complicated because the input is either a value or a, or a Boolean. If it's a Boolean, then we have fitness distance as one if it's uh, not a match and zero if it is a match. And if it's a number, it's the exact uh, same algorithm as before. And so uh, that is the first proposal. Any questions on that? Any thoughts? I think that's the way so, we, we implemented it in, in Chromium. Great. I mean, I don't so, know. I don't remember if the if, if the web idea looks like that. But the implementation of once you know that it's a true, the, the way to select this by 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 having that into the fitness computation. So it, it's it should work. Yeah. Uh, in Chrome, uh, it's not uh, it's not possible to uh, specify ideal true or, or okay. Yep. Well, ideal true is uh, sort of a dialect that is mostly unnecessary. Um, I should clarify that uh, because of a change in media capture main, uh, required constraints are now opt in, which means that uh, there's a big impact on image capture. That is that you cannot use required constraints anymore. So, uh, well, uh, strict, strictly speaking, uh, required cons uh, constraints are not treated as required unless listed for device selection. For uh, right, okay. For for uh, apply constraints, the uh, required works as before. Got it. Right. Okay. So there are some permutations there that. Uh, you could use, but they're they're not adding new functionality much. Um, although you could use apply constraints to, well, this this isn't really necessary for apply constraints because that's you already have a camera and it either has pants tilt support or it doesn't. So this is largely uh, redundant for apply constraints. Yeah. Right. So uh, as I said previously, for the fitness distance may or should. Um, pan tilt zoom for us being a privilege uh, permission, we might think that we, if we implement it, we might not think that we would go with a fitness distance with this proposal for PTC. Okay. Well, there's already a should there, so that should allow you to innovate. Um, and I think we're happy to have better ideas, but uh, we also want to fix the bug that is there in the spec right now, I think, because right now it. <laughs> If you ask for zoom, pan, tilt, or zoom, it's true. And then you specify one other constraint like 1080, uh, there's really no preference for pan, tilt, or zoom capability at all, the way the spec is written. And I think implementations already go beyond that. So this will be closer to what is implemented. Uh, there's also the issue that uh, even if uh, pan, tilt, zoom is uh, related to permission when there's a, some cameras which are uh, zoom only and some cameras which are pantin and zoom. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, 
uh, fitness distance might be a good uh, choice to select between zoom on the camera and pan tilt zoom camera. So I missed the last part. Uh, fitness distance would be. Uh, so uh, fitness distance might be a good choice to uh, select uh, uh, Right. Web page for zoom only camera or pan tilt zoom camera. Right. So, because so for yes. So for constraints, we'll then narrow down the selection of choices uh, first, and then if if the user is still, uh, and then from that, if there are any pan tilt and zoom cameras that made the cut, uh, then you know you would be able to show a permission prompt based on the camera that uh, you're you're asking the user for. And if that's more than one camera, um, that sort of a permission is somewhat orthogonal to that, I claim, in that uh, I agree that user agents should try to not uh, grant more permission than needed for what uh, has been returned to the, the site. So that's sort of uh, orthogonal to this a bit, because this is um, more about getting web compat uh, around uh, the way that applications describe their demands. All right, if there are no other questions, then uh, we can move this to ready for PR. All right, so uh, a second part of that problem is that it's a bit unspecified or unspecified whether non pan tilt zoom cameras actually satisfy the default values because regular cameras have one to one zoom, right? So does zoom one uh, give you regular cameras, or does it guarantee you a, a, an adjustable zoom camera? Same for pan and tilt. Um, so proposal A is to say they do, which means that if you specify true, that would prefer, or, or level uh, two, which would imply, since no cameras have zoom two by default, that would prefer, prefer an adjustable uh, camera. Uh, where, but asking for zoom one gives no camera preference when it comes to adjustable zoom. And proposal B is that uh, they do not qualify. And then we could specify that in pros and media capture main. And my suggestion here was for all can camera constraints, for all constraints, not in the list of inherent constrainable properties, uh, if constraint name is not supported by the device, the fitness distance is one. <clears throat> and the list of inherent constrainable properties is something we added uh, recently to uh, that has a list of basically device ID, facing mode, and one more thing, which are properties that are inherent of the camera, for instance. Uh, all cameras uh, has a facing mode or not. The website doesn't, the browser doesn't always know, but um, we want to exclude those from this new rule because uh, uh, facing mode does not imply give me a camera that can flip, right? Any comments on this? If Zoom one is no camera preference, uh, is, is this the same as not specifying Zoom at all? Well, that's the question. If the application asks for Zoom one, would it be surprised if it got a camera back that, that you couldn't Zoom with? Yeah. Uh, also, uh, same for pan, and tilt, pan zero yeah. or tilt zero would be the same. Uh, the specific question also says that the zoom is usually ratio, but it doesn't say that it must be a ratio. So it could be that the default is something other than one. Right. So this is admittedly a corner case. It's more about you know what do we want to specify so it works the same in browsers. Would the, would there be a difference that if you say zoom one? and it happens to be a, a Zoom camera, that it would overwrite whatever it's currently set at, and then, you know, remove the Zoom? Or well, if, if, be... if, yes, they would do that if you only had a Zoom camera or if you had multiple cameras and your Zoom camera was the system default, I guess. Where did we land on uh, if requiring that you get the Zoom? camera if i have one zoom camera and one non zoom camera and i say uh, and i say zoom true do, will i necessarily get the zoom camera or will i maybe get the zoom camera well we, re we removed required constraints so there's no way for the site to demand <clears throat> a pan tilt or zoom camera 
but I want, assuming we fix the fitness distance, then uh, if you put in, you know, pan, tilt, zoom, uh, then unless there are competing constraints, then uh, you would uh, very much uh, get that camera. I don't know if the spec actually allows the, user agent, the users to opt out of pan, tilt, zoom. They might. So you might still not get. So there's no guarantee that you can get a pan, tilt, zoom camera is the short answer. But you can check that once you've gotten the stream, you can use uh, uh, get capabilities on the track you get to figure out whether you can adjust these values or not. Which is what you're going to do anyway, because we never standardize min and max ranges for pan, tilt, or zoom. So you kind of have to do that in order to know what, what values to to add to apply constraints, which is why uh, we have true in the first place, because it's really hard to know what values to put in to get user media before you for, know those ranges. For device selection, uh, I said that previously, but I will restate it. I think get user media video zoom two makes sense, and get user media video zoom two or zoom one does not make a lot of sense. We should restrict right. that to apply constraints. Well, um, I, well, I think uh, I don't know if I agree that I, I know that with constraints we have a lot of uh, syntax that is overkill, but uh, it's it's well implemented and. Uh, at some point, if it's, I think it's more important about that it's predictable across the different uh, APIs than uh, that necessarily every use case, every corner has an as a need. So, but is that something we can continue discussing? Uh, well, how long this? is it for time? All right, we're getting close to out of time. Uh, should I move um, on a bit or wait? We... Uh, re review is in the queue. Yeah. Hey, uh, uh, right. Jennifer and Yuen, uh, do you want to say something about implementation in the various uh, uh, like image capture implementation on Firefox or Safari? Is there a is it in your plans? Um, I think for Firefox, we don't have any uh, immediate short term plans. For Safari, it's the same, but we want to make sure that. The model is good enough so that we could implement it at some point. Yeah. Uh, we we also welcome uh, external developers to start doing it. Same. To me, it seems confusing to mix uh, picking a camera with you know acting like reconfiguring that camera after it's picked. Right? Maybe I mm -hmm. want a camera with a very high capability to zoom. Maybe I specify a very high zoom value, uh, and then, but then, if this is if it's picking based on the current zoom value and like picking the ones closest to what I choose, I'm, oh, I'm completely not sure. agree. Right. So yeah, in practice, this is more to align with the constraint syntax. What you're going to use is not you're not going to do these edge cases. Uh, you're going to specify zoom true. And once you have the device, you're going to specify a value. So to move so, this along, I kind of vote for proposal B. Uh, that way, I think that's closely, since these are edge cases anyway, if someone puts zoom with any kind, regardless of whether it's a Boolean or a value, you're asking for a camera that has adjustable zoom. I think that just makes sense. And proposal so, B would clarify that in the spec right now. If everybody, if everybody agrees with that, uh, zoom through in get user media and uh, numerical values in apply constraints, that's what makes sense. We should just uh, state that in the <clears throat> in the logs and build the spec around those ideas. Right. Uh, however, we'd still need to make these changes in WebIDL. So I, I vote we go with proposal B now, and we can always restrict, add that restriction and discuss it separately. I think that's the right approach. I, I would not do proposal A in that case. Would that work, Ewan? Um, I'm not sure. So you, you would go with proposal B and basically have another issue stating that we should rest it to zoom through in get user media in the, as a separate issue? Yes. I think that's a step in the right direction because then any mention of zoom means that non-zoom cameras need not apply. Yeah, 
Yeah, I guess we, we could do that. Um, I hope I will get back up when I will find the issue. <laughs> All right, cool. Thanks. I think we're at time then. We have some more slides. Maybe we can move to have some time. Uh, there's just two more slides, I guess. Um, it's for one me more. to capture for Dom. One, one Again? more slide. One more slide? All right, I, I can do it quickly. You, you have uh, the, the, one, the one slide that has this, that uh, shows this. Right. So, all right, cool. So there's some, this is an old issue just to move uh, media capture from element along a little bit. Uh, hopefully there's agreement on this one. It had some old unimplemented language that had this weird behavior that if a media track can only end once. So a track, an audio video track in an element, uh, element sense, if that's enabled, disabled or re-enabled, it will be captured as two separate tracks. I don't think anyone's implemented that. So the proposal is to tie instead tie the media stream track lifetime, uh, the media stream track you get from capture stream, tie its lifetime to the audio track and video track in the element. This is for uh, element capture stream. And then have the, the, the only downside is the media stream track would then produce nothing at times, uh, basically pause on the last frame when disabled or restarted. Uh, but it seems uh, a lot simpler to understand the model that way. And it also fixes uh, uh, infinite cycles where you can basically, if you do element source object equals element capture stream, or if you create a different cycle through a second element, uh, the uh, source objects load algorithm actually saves us there because it removes all selected enabled tracks. And that will cause the capture stream to end. So the, as soon as you assign source object to uh, uh, something else, then what it is already emitting will end. So you don't have to worry about cycles. Any Anyone opposed? Seems logical to me. All right, cool. <laughs> then we are at the time almost. <laughs> yeah, the transcription, transcription of seems logical will sound magical. <laughs> Great. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we'll be meeting on yeah. Thursday at this same time using the same conference parameters, and we'll be largely focusing on new work. Okay. See you then. Okay. Yeah. See you then. Bye. Bye for now.